Hi, I'm Risa Gorlick, and I'm going to talk to you about service learning and writing. When I started graduate school uh, for my PhD in the mid-90s, I really didn't know what service le learning was. And one of my college friends was doing service learning in the high schools out in Los Angeles and had flown into New Orleans for a conference when I was living in Louisiana. And I went to meet him there and crashed his conference and sat in on this and said, oh, I think I'm doing some of this stuff. I didn't know there was a term for this. When I started teaching in Louisiana, uh, we were at an open admissions university. Most of the students uh, had literacy issues. They had never written a research paper. It was a state requirement that they write one, and they were scared. Yeah. As a Yankee moving to the rural South, uh, my students thought I was kind of fun, and they would tease me and ask me things like, have you ever tried the alligator? What about crawfish? We had this whole discussion one day before class about a crawfish ball. I thought they were saying a B-A-L-L -L and thought it was something you went to it with a tiara and a Mardi Gras. They told me you don't wear anything white because it's messy. I finally said, please spell what you're saying. And they said, it's a crawfish ball, B-O-I-L. I'm like, that's a boil. They said, no, it's not. So we had a lot of fun with food. And what I decided to have them do was to research and write about their family recipes. And you know, they had to do interviews with people in their family. Would it not be a holiday without this dish? Are there people who don't eat it? Uh, what were the connotations associated with it? Would it not be, you know, uh, a specific, you know, celebration without this food? Would you, and, and we had a good time with this. And while reading some issues in a textbook about homelessness, one student made the connection about, you know, that these people were hungry. And here we are talking about all this food in this region. And wouldn't it be interesting to, you know, kind of see what we could do with this? And so we got to thinking and brainstorming, and we decided to write a cookbook with the recipes that they were writing their research papers on. So I had them write abstracts, and then I went around to local coffee shops and asked if people would donate their printing services since we were at a state university with no funding. And my last person in the phone book I called had done some volunteer work as a teenager at the soup kitchen in town, and I told them that they were going to be the ones who would, you know, all the proceeds would go to the soup kitchen. And he said, well, this is a great idea, and I'll be happy to print them. So we ran a couple hundred copies of them, and somebody in the graduate program had worked for the local newspaper and they put me on the front page of the food section with a couple students. We had cooked a couple dishes. And I was a girl who almost failed home ec and the teacher said it was a good thing I was smart and pretty because I couldn't uh, cook or sew. But apparently I can edit cookbooks. And so we had a really good time with this project and what it showed me uh, and the students was that even though they were first generation college students, it took a lot of knowledge that wasn't necessarily book related for people to be able to produce these kinds of food. Louisiana grew the most rice in the nation, the continental U.S. They had seasons for crawfish where they farmed it, uh, sugar cane. And a lot of them grew up on these farms or near them and they had families who worked in these industries and you know, and needed to know a lot of information you don't get out of a textbook about how to do these things. I would be a pretty bad crawfish farmer, I think. Uh, and so I think it gave them an understanding that, you know, it's, it's a great thing to come to college, but that people who don't go to college still have a lot of knowledge. And we published the cookbook and in two semesters raised $1,000 for the local soup kitchen. And I think it really taught them that you needed to give something back to the community and, you know, and, and that, you know, you can show with the service learning that there's a reason to write, there's an audience, people, uh, you don't get those teacher papers, those dear teacher papers where you know they're writing to such an artificial audience because other people are going to read it. So we had their recipes and we had you know brief abstracts, which was the story behind a brief you know paragraph or two story about why they picked this recipe. Would it not be Christmas or Mardi Gras or somebody's birthday without this recipe? And then uh, so they published it. And one Saturday morning, I got a phone call from some woman with a very heavy Cajun accent saying that she had seen the article in the paper, and she looked me up in the phone book, and she bought the cookbook, and she got the last copy, and then she wanted to ask me questions about how to prepare this dish. And I'm like, lady, I'm a Yankee. I have no idea, but let me call you back. And, and, so, and I came back to class the next day and said, okay, well, who did this recipe? This woman wants you to call her and, and tell her how to make it. Uh, and so, but we had a really good time, and, and it gave us a lot of, of fun stuff to talk about. And I think it's probably one of my most successful 
projects with a first year class where you really got the aha moment because they saw you know how writing is first generated uh, with some brainstorming ideas and it brought them a lot of like pleasure to talk about what they're cooking now that I'm no longer in Louisiana this project doesn't transfer well out of there um, but I have been able to, to design courses around food and writing and um, and students really relate well to the topic because we all have to eat